is a special lecture that I do. Uh, on the 26th of November, I live in uh, Paris, and uh, I w do this uh, work in Belgium, so the, uh, we do this uh, Congress in a very scaring uh, atmosphere, uh, political, uh, and I have a few thoughts for uh, what happened uh, in Paris, what will not happen in uh, Belgium, uh, I hope, uh, very, very deeply. But let us make uh, medicine. Uh, I work in the medical intensive care unit driven by uh, Antoine Vierre Baron, here present, that was uh, Francois Jardin previously. And uh, we will speak on the blue protocol that is basic and advanced. So once again, uh, uh, it is, uh, I reiterate the honor to be invited in this uh, prestigious uh, moment. We are very close together. Still no conflict of interest. We will speak of a big, big topic. Lung ultrasound is uh, 400 pages. I wanted to make a short textbook, but it makes anyway 400. Normally, there should not be such a lecture because there is in the Harrison the proof that you cannot insulate the lung. So these are three simple examples that will show that, yes, it is possible to do it. I am in the medical intensive care. That is, when I am on night shift, half of the time they wake me. It is for a vital concern. Respiratory failure, for instance, this is a lady who will not comment all the story. We just have a challenge between left and right dyspnea. Normally, echo should provide the answer, but sometimes we have no cardiac window. The heart is hidden by these bloody lung parasites. And this is, instead of a beautiful uh, parasternal view, we see these uh, artifacts. And probably you recognize that these are B lines, several B lines, that is lung rockets. They move. This is the B profile of the blue protocol. Instead of this ill defined radiograph, we have a standardized lung ultrasound, lung rockets, lung sliding anteriorly, that show. It's called the B profile, and the priority diagnosis is hemodynamic pulmonary edema. That's critical ultrasound. That is, you have the possibility to immediately change your therapeutic plans, and it was eventually uh, pulmonary edema, of course. Now, an example of a cardiac arrest. That's the CSAB protocol. And uh, a lady who has the pneumonia in the world makes a cardiac arrest. You know that the blindest management is given to the sickest patient. That's ironic. That's why I always come with my uh, ultrasound machine. So cardiac arrest, just stop on the image, 32 centimeters. So easy to put at the bedside, switch on immediate, seven seconds, and one universal probe for scanning, for scanning this, that is, all these points that are in the sequential protocol of the CSAB protocol just published uh, with the manual brain, precisely. We begin by the lung. We will do this CSAB protocol together. Left lung. Lung sliding, fine, no problem. Right lung. Oh, oh, I don't see any lung sliding. We will enlarge the image. And definitely, I see this is the plural line, nothing happening upper and below, making the stratosphere pattern at the right and mode. And we see also this repetition of the plural line, the A line, and both signs make the A prime profile. That is a high suspicion of pneumothorax, very likely. Time permitting, we should see the lung point that is a specific sign allowing us to treat quietly this cause of cardiac arrest. A case 
of circulatory failure. So I update, voila. That's a young man who took a lot of carbamates. He's in shock, coma plus shock. And you can see with a simple echocardiography that the shock is not related to a cardiac paralysis due to carbamate. This is lung ultrasound, lung sliding, yes, of course, but a repetition of the pleural line. Both make the A profile. That is the normal profile that we all have in this room. And uh, we decrease this patient false responder. We will give fluid, and this fluid will treat what was a hypovolemic shock. It was in the summer. We we'll try to find some time for the questions. We will use certain tools for the blue protocol. First, we will prefer a simple machine. This is the one I used since 1992. One probe that suits for the whole body. A simple technique, so we scan the lung, the veins. We have access to 10 signs. And these 10 signs, normally, it's a reminder, but I see sometimes some uh, distortion, so I prefer to repeat a few basic points. This is the plural line, making the bad sign, and it always indicates the parietal pleura. Parietal pleura is here all the time. The A line is the repetition of the plural line. It indicates that below the parietal pleura, you have gas. Lung sliding is the third sign indicating, so we will see all this space called Merlin space, which will highlight when I put the video, beginning exactly from the pleural line, and this indicates that the gas below the parietal pleura is alveolar gas. So this is also the visceral pleura. The lung moves. That's completely physiological. And we can display it on M mode. That's the seashore sign. Rapidly, this is the universal sign of pleural effusion. That is the visualization of a regular line parallel to the pleural line. In other words, the lung line and the lung line is, of course, the visceral pleura, which makes a quite a gold standard at the bedside, regardless of the color of the effusion, importantly. In one slide, the lung consolidation, you can see a fractal boundary between this structural tissue-like pattern and the aerated lung underlying. And this makes also a gold standard, a reasonable gold standard at the bedside. Interstitial syndrome. This is the elementary sign that is seven points that makes one description. Three points are constant. The interstitial syndrome is initially always a comet's tail artifact. That's always, always. It always arises from the pleural line, bad sign. It always moves with lung sliding. It is dependent from visceral pleura. And we have four items which are quite always. And the word quite makes the definition working in all cases. Quite always it is well-defined like a laser. Quite always, uh, it spreads without fading, that is, it is long. You can see here. Quite always, it erases the A lines that should be located exactly at this, at this standardized distance. And quite always, the B line, so we call it the B line after the A line, A, B. 
the B-line is white, hyperechoic, like is the pleural line. With those seven definitions, you are always confident to recognize the B-line. What is interstitial syndrome? It is three or more B-lines between two ribs. Said differently, it is more than two B-lines between two ribs. This is interstitial syndrome. This parasite is not a B-line. It looks, it is a comet tail, it arises from the pleural line, but it has none of the five other criteria. So it's not a pitfall, it's a pseudo pitfall, it's a Z-line, which is a parasite of unknown uh, origin. Pneumothorax. Uh, we have the ninth signs of tail, which is abolish lung sliding. We try not to complicate what can be simplified, not to fall into uh, uh, pathologic simplification. But we can. This is the abolition of lung sliding. This image is completely standstill, making the stratosphere sign. We have, so it looks like a stratospheric uh, pattern. I prefer this to barcode, personally. And we have the A line already in the scale. So let's not lose time. This is the A prime profile, that is, no lung sliding with a line, a prime profile. And you can see it works all the time, high sensitivity. This is the tenth side, that is the lung point, which is an A prime, you can see an A prime profile suddenly replaced by, here, I can see something like a B profile. And this sudden alternance makes the diagnosis of the lung point that is the diagnosis of pneumothorax. For the same cost, you have the volume of the pneumothorax. Well, now we will see the blue protocol per se. And we will try to define what is a holistic ultrasound a discipline is holistic when you must understand each of its components for understanding the whole. And I give a few examples. When you add the lung to the simple heart, you have less need for sophisticated approaches. When the lung is added, a single probe will make the best compromise for scanning the whole body. When you consider the width of a machine and not the height, you realize that uh, you can do without a laptop if you have a narrow machine. Wheels are a very important uh, uh, technology. It's, it's, it was a disruptive uh, revolution 5,000 years ago. Critical ultrasound includes uh, venous cannulation, etc., and lung ultrasound. Lung ultrasound includes pleural effusion, etc., and lung rockets. And these lung rockets are a bit the core of the blue protocol, and false protocol, and CSAMI protocol, and several other protocols. Uh, the blue protocol is uh, this uh, philosophy that is, uh, when you see a pleural effusion, you see a pleural effusion. The blue protocol tells you not only this is a pleural effusion, but it corresponds to this diagnosis, hemodynamic, etc. The blue protocol is a fast protocol. Yes, you can do it in three minutes or far less sometimes using lung and venous ultrasound. Which machine? So we like to work with the fastest, the smallest, the cleanest machine because we have to go between lateral obstacles, not uh, upstairs obstacles. And we like machines which respect the artifacts. If they don't, you can 
more difficultly make long ultrasound. The machine is important, the probe is very important because we are not cardiologists, radiologists, or geologists, or gynecologists. We are intensivists. And this probe allows a perfect approach to the lungs and the veins and the abdomen and the heart, allowing to write all our books without having to change the probe. Range 0.6, 17 centimeters, universal probe. And I think we are not the least of the medical disciplines and we can maybe have our probe. And you can see when you scan the heart with the veins, with the lungs, together you have a little less need for sophisticated approaches. That's holistic ultrasound. And we have a very small pride not to have waited for the laptop revolution for carrying our patients. So since uh, 1982, we have the ADR4000. 1992, we have this uh, Japanese machine. I like it. You can make ultrasound with any kind of ultrasound machine, including the laptop machines. It will be a bit or a lot more difficult, but if you want, you will succeed. So you must be happy with your material, because you can. Give me any machine, I will make you any ultrasound. Sometimes I will suffer, but if we want, we can. So, Let's do this blue protocol. Decision tree. The main disease that we have seen in our uh, Parisian uh, hospital, these patients are adults seen in the emergency room admitted to the ICU, so a special population. And we will see that these data are obtained when you combine a location, anterior is not posterior, with usually two signs. That is, this is the location, we are the anterior chest wall. We see the pleural line, that's the la base, the, the tonic. And what I see here is a lung sliding, and after I see a A-line. And this is the A profile. And uh, this lung sliding and lung rockets can be present absent, present present, absent present, absent absent. That makes already four diagnoses of worrying disease. These are four of the eight profiles of the blue protocol. Let us breathe, we will do it a little uh, slowly. So, blue protocol, that is blue patient, we are at the anterior chest wall where we use the principle of simplicity. Uh, this patient has lung sliding and no beeline, no lung rockets. This is the A profile. The next patient that you will see in the emergency room with massive pulmonary embolism will likely have this anterior profile. Make your experience. This patient has the same lung sliding, but here the artifacts are vertical and lung rockets. That's the B profile. Wait, your next patient with a standard hemodynamic pulmonary edema, this patient will very likely have this profile. Make your opinion. Now, we have the same lung rockets, but motionless. That is two disease, interstitial syndrome and abolition of compliance. We called it the B prime profile, a prime like a stop. And I bet that the next patient that you will see with this profile will have pneumonia or ARDS that makes the same uh, patterns. 
B prime profile. And obviously, a blue patient who has no longer sliding, no longer rockets, that is the A prime profile, as we called it, has likely a pneumothorax as the cause of the respiratory failure. One sign that is a posterior sign, that is the PLAPS, that is the posterior lateral alveolar and or pleural syndrome, that is, it can be completely alveolar, completely pleural, or both. It's so frequent that we wanted to give a name to that. And it simplifies the scale from decaphonic to diatonic because uh, you need four signs are made one regardless if you have alveolar or pleural syndrome. We will make uh, one example with a hemodynamic edema, showing again that the B profile is made of what? It is made of the B line with the seven criteria. This B line must be numerous, that is making lung rockets. These lung rockets must be anterior disseminated and they must absolutely, this is important, be associated with lung sliding. I can tell it rapidly. We have a transudative disease, so this is oil. And the oil does not prevent the movement of the lung in the chest wall. And all this is the B profile. Let us see this dyspneic patient. We can see that lung sliding is present, yes that we have several B lines, that is lung rockets, and disseminated, which is expected from a hemodynamic edema because all the septa are invaded by the transudate. So this is the B profile, and the blue diagnosis of hemodynamic pulmonary edema has this uh, data, that is a nice sensitivity, a specificity which is not 100, you have space for differential diagnosis, and the whole is done in 20 seconds for the diagnosis. For having the microphone, it is uh, 20 years. That's the cost to pay. Years are passing. So what happened for making a slight uh, relaxation? Very simply, today uh, you have ultrasound in all your uh, intensive care units, probably thanks to our chair, very likely. And uh, nobody is surprised to see a doctor, an intensivist, an emergency physician uh, using ultrasound. Uh, it's not a surprise. Uh, when we did that in uh, 1985 uh, in this uh, area of uh, Paris, doing it nightly for borrowing the machine, it was really considered as a strange uh, behavior. We learned ultrasound in 1983-84. We began our uh, responsibilities in intensive care in 1985, and this is where we borrowed the machine uh, in the night. There was nobody in the radiology department. And fortunately, since 1989, I had the great opportunity to work with uh, Francois Jardin who was the first to have an echo machine for cardiac assessment in the ICU. So I was at the best place for defining the holistic critical ultrasound, that is the whole body approach, and we had already narrow machines. So what did I do? Scanning, scanning the patients, inserting the probe everywhere, and it was not uh, scary to put them in the forbidden areas, such as the lung. That was just answering the question, how can we be useful? So an article submitted, a paper a book published, the Vancouver Conference, thanks to Olivier Axler, and a book with pages. If you wanted to make the fast protocol, you open the page 25, or inserting your uh, subclavian venous catheter, page 110, inferior caval vein, optic nerve, 
a simple vision of the heart, but, but we were completely taken by the lung, which was the priority target, that's the main vital organ, and we had to fight against the dogma that is still today in the Los Calzo Harrison textbook, some decision letters, all negative, and all these manuscripts in order to submit Blue Protocol. So rapidly, today, it makes 20 years after our first uh, papers, this is the usual time when you want to break a dogma. Now, it makes the work much easier, and I have many friends, it's a whole family which every day uh, increases and publish, publish, publishes. We have just ruled in pulmonary edema with the data, that is sensitivity specificity, but imagine you want to rule out. For instance, I don't know, pneumothorax. Well, you have lung sliding, you have lung rockets, you have two signs that really rule out the diagnosis of pneumothorax. Clearly, it is, unlike, it is uh, impossible to imagine. COPD or asthma, that's a more frequent uh, uh, story. You have interstitial signs, so it is not consistent with COPD or simple asthma. It is a complicated asthma or not an asthma. That is a cardiac asthma. Pulmonary embolism. We see the B profile in 4% of cases. So it is unlikely. Let's be cautious, just unlikely. So in pulmonary embolism, we had the word pulmonary, so we will look at the heart, of course, but also to the lung. And very simply, at the anterior chest wall, what we see in most cases is this profile that is the normal A profile. Lung sliding is present. That's an observation. So we have the A profile usually. The blue protocol invites to look at the veins in the second shell protocol, still unpublished. And when you see a thrombosed vein, the blue diagnosis of pulmonary embolism with this lung and venous data is done in a nice majority of patients. But if one of these patients is unstable, the specificity rate indicates that 99 plus your clinical findings allows you to possibly treat unstable patients. The venous step is specific, different from the usual protocols, but it is not the target here, and it is unfortunately still unpublished in spite of my uh, endless efforts. This is the ADR 4000, the machine for the revolution, used uh, since 1982 at uh, François Jardin. Uh, this gentleman has an abolition of lung sliding with A lines, A prime profile. If we scan laterally, we see that there is a not beautiful but uh, really indisputable lung point. If you want more modern images, just ask, 1992, please, 1992, no lung sliding A-lines, lung point. COPD asthma is long, but if we have no time, normal lungs, normal veins. Lung sliding is present, even very weak in very severe asthma, so A profile, equivalent. The venous analysis is, of course, negative. Then we come back to the posterior lung, we come to the posterior lung, and of course we will see no plaps, and we see the newt profile that indicates usually with this data the both diagnosis that we put together for simplifying the decision tree to make it as uh, light as possible.
Do you want, uh, it's 30 minutes, do you want to make a short break or uh, asking uh, one question and we come back to the lecture? Or should we go on? I will ask to the okay, chair. We continue. We, continue. Uh, we will have time for questions. Now we are in advance. Pneumonia is probably uh, the most complicated, but ironically the fastest. So keep your attention. We have one uh, pulmonary edema, one pulmonary embolism, but we have uh, thousands of disease, microbial disease. But fortunately, only four profiles. And we will see most of these four profiles. One that we saw already is the B prime profile, that is, the patient has an interstitial syndrome with abolition of lung compliance. That's typical from pneumonia. The second profile, that's very simple, is what we call the C profile, that is looking an anterior, anterior lung consolidation in a dyspneic patient. This is a large consolidation, typical with the straight sign. Lung sliding can be present or, like here, absent. C profile, usually pneumonia. Even if it is a small one, you can see here a very small minute C line, we call them C lines. The plural line is like a stamp. And this is a sign that you don't see in a hemodynamic edema at the anterior chest wall. This is an extreme example of a dotted pleural line that suggests highly pneumonia. Another kind of C profile. The AB profile is one more of the four profiles of infection, that is asymmetry. Lung rockets here, spared areas there. It can be at both lungs, it can be at one lung. It is uh, rather uh, highly suggestive. Uh, the AV PLAPS profile is a bit complicated, but very simply, this is a patient with a posterior pneumonia with no anterior extension, so he will have the A profile. The veins have to be screened, they will be normal, of course, in the, emergen in the emergency room. And you will see posteriorly a PLAPS, posteriorly, of course, and in this sequence, this lung consolidation is labeled pneumonia. These four, four profiles are not frequent, but when you add the frequency, you have 89, and the specificity all in all is not bad. And if your concern is to make a diagnosis in the emergency room or in the ward of ARDS, seen in admission, you have exactly the same profiles. Pneumonia and ARDS have, from the ultrasound point of view, the same profiles. That is, they have the B profile in a minority of cases. It happens. But mostly in 86, I, I would say 75, with a large number of patients, remaining cases have one of these four profiles of pneumonia. Of course, we have uh, anticipated uh, many, many questions. For instance, uh, why was the heart not included? And the answer is, rapidly, because time is running, that we have a vision of the suffering organ, a respiratory failure regards the lung, and we scan the lung first. But of course, if you have an ultrasound probe in your hand, it should be very reduced not to scan the heart. 
So unlike the cardiologists who do not want to see the lung, we are completely willing to see the heart. It is part of our uh, culture. So we associate it. But if we have a blue patient with this profile, we know about the systolic and even the diastolic function of the left heart at the coaptation of the valves. If we have no beeline, we have no pulmonary edema. And in this specific case, we are allowed to think of another disease than a pulmonary edema, that is the diastolic function, which has a word in the USA, that is the diastology, indicates that probably it is not so simple, but not all the faculty agree. That's a debate. This is a patient with a profile with, whoops, a beautiful uh, floating venous thrombosis. I, if the patient is unstable, I can say to the nurse to initiate the therapy, and I will look at the heart. And in this case, I don't have a beautiful view of the right ventricle because all the patients don't have a beautiful windows. And look, the left ventricle is uh, diseased, but does not generate pulmonary edema. So this left heart hypocontractility is not linked to the diagnosis. I see no edema and a DVT, and I will consider embolism. With, as you can see, one probe for the lung, the veins, and the heart. So this slide indicates how we see the patients in the emergency room. We make the physical examination. We ask for basic tests. And uh, we insert the blue protocol just after our physical examination, immediately followed by the simple emergency cardiac sonography. That's how I called it. In order, if we can reduce this step, which in our occidental countries 20 years ago was very long, but in the rest of the world today is even not existing because they don't have any of these tools, CAT scan, echocardiography, Doppler, and I put the blood gas here because just it is painful. And we guess that the four elements here allow to make usually the diagnosis. Briefly, we are happy to relieve the patient uh, sooner and to limit the irradiation, of course. These are the, the protocol based on the lung rockets. We have to speak now because we are in the advanced, yes, now we are in the advanced blue protocol. The false protocol is an ultrasound assessment of circulatory failure that begins by the heart and which will assess the endpoint looking at the lung. This is one of the multiple applications of the lung rockets, not respiratory, but here circulatory. Pulmonary artery occlusion pressure for the oldest of you who inserted Swangans catheters. It answers to the question to give fluid or not and when to stop. That is the two main questions when we deal with a uh, most circulatory failures. So this is the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure study. You can see an empty space here, which indicates that when you have briefly, briefly, a A-line pattern or equivalent, you have a low PAOP. It can be 17, it can be zero, but it is lower than 18. We spend all our time on the screen looking at artifacts, and I know only A lines and B lines, which means that if there was an intermediate artifact, I would be very unlucky not to have seen it after all these years, which means that the B lines it generated all of a sudden. Very suddenly, this is a lung scan. We insonate this patient. We don't see the interlobular septa that makes a A lines. 
we will infuse fluids and block the kidneys so the fluids will come and begin to enlarge the septa. Still A lines. The fluid enlarges them a little more, still A lines. A little more A lines. At a critical thickness, here for instance, we will see suddenly B lines appearing. It is an on off parameter. I don't detail the, the generation of the B line, it's not the target here. And uh, as would say uh, Michel Slama with the Doppler, uh, the difference between uh, two numbers is a pressure. I would say that the difference between dry septa and uh, second septa, that is dry and wet, this difference is fluid. We will see that this fluid is a limited value, uh, quantity, but a high quality fluid. And we have an on-off marker of volemia, which is not uh, very frequent in medicine. We have uh, caval veins, maturations, but here is an on-off marker. So this is a patient with plenty of fluids in the body. This is the interstitial compartment here, the alveolar compartment, the fragile one. And if we give fluid, we have access to this interstitial compartment, which is a few milliliters, but of high strategical value and accessible to ultrasound. And it is a uh, occult preclinical step of pulmonary edema. If we give fluids again, again, and again, we have a security factor. We will see that A lines get B lines and we discontinue our fluid therapy. And uh, uh, because time is running very briefly, false protocol is fluid administration limited by lung sonography. Sometimes I make some uh, acronyms, not always. Very schematically, very, very schematically, after a, a simple echocardiography, if you have no lung rockets, you can give fluid to usual shocked patients with fortunately limitations and sometimes important limitations, such as the, the postoperative patient with open pericardium, for instance. Very schematically, if lung rockets appear under your fluid therapy, this is the end point where we stop the fluid. Very, very schematically, lung rockets appearing under fluid therapy suggest the diagnosis of distributive shock that is in daily practice septic shock. So this is the Max Harivail terminology. We begin by the peri heart, by the heart, one item, the volume of the right ventricle. Uh, we search for pneumothorax, all this is obstructive shock, then cardiogenic from left origin, one more limitation, that is the usual cardiogenic shock. So we are at this step. When we have the A profile, after ruling out obstructive and cardiogenic shock, we administrate fluid. And this makes the difference between those patients who will improve from those who do not improve. And if you give fluid at one moment, you have B lines appearing. Provocatively, we can say that the false protocol does give zero drop of fluid in a septic shock, as opposed to the Manu reverse protocol, who gives a massive fluid therapy. We give zero drop. We can keep that for the questions. And the false protocol can, no, no, must, false protocol must be associated with the technique that you daily use. So now you have a synthesis of this year, and it is really holistic ultrasound. That is one simple machine, one probe, and lung and heart together. The SISAMI protocol. The relevance of the SISAMI protocol is to show that 
in the normal daily life, all the ultrasound machines are good. And you can be happy. When each second counts, because CSAMI protocol is in the cardiac arrest, you will see that this vintage material works better than up-to-date machines. So you have to accept this fact. This is a paper uh, that is just published with a manual brain that was corrected uh, last week in Paris. You need a small machine. If a laptop is large, you will lose seconds for displacing objects. If your machine switch on in two minutes, don't switch it on. Make the current management of a cardiac arrest. We have one probe that allows in the CSAMI sequence to scan with the perfect uh, resolution the lung, the vein, one specific vein, the abdomen, the pericardium and the heart of course, it's a cardiac arrest. And the cost effectiveness is of interest for nobody in our civilized countries. This is the sequence. The, the vein has been chosen above the knee because you have 48% uh, of positive answers in massive pulmonary embolism. So this is the decision tree. You can see the five items. The probe for the lung, the lung again, the pulmonary embolism, the bleeding of the abdomen, the pericardium and the heart. The depths, you can see that no change has been done. And you push zero button. When you switch on your machine, the probe is ready, the depth is ready. You have nothing to do, and you don't have any lung setting. You have, let's say, a sesame setting or a whole body setting. And is there a need to validate the sesame protocol? The answer is no. All the applications, that is pneumothorax, embolism, etc., has been have been validated already. You just do it faster. That's the simple difference. And for making it faster you require specific machines. The PINK protocol, lower case, it's not an acronym, the patients are PINK, but they have no longer any lung that is IRDS. You will see the barotrauma, you will see if you can withdraw fluid, you will see if you can uh, recruit alveolar consolidation, if it is your policy to recruit, and other items with uh, quantitative data for each of them, pink protocol. The Lucy FLR project is no longer a project because you have begun to do it already. That is to decrease medical irradiation. You see, you, even the radiologists admit that they irradiate a little too much the patients, especially with the new CAT scans. Ultrasound has data not far from CAT scan. But if you want to have the best machine and make CAT scan anyway, we will answer to you that sometimes ultrasound is superior. Here you can see a lung consolidation, probably a pneumonia on CAT scan, pneumonia. Ultrasound shows the same pneumonia. But as you can see, in addition, these necrotizing areas that's a necrotizing pneumonia. You can change your antibiotics. The gold standard in this paper is CAT scan six days after. Here you have a pleural effusion, I suppose. Pleural effusion, yes. Ultrasound shows the same. With, in addition, these septations that are not seen, they know well, on CAT scan, that's an exudative pleural effusion, unlike the clinical history suggested. Here you have alveolar consolidation with air bronchograms, correct. Ultrasound shows the same. You can see the air bronchograms, they are white, 
oh, look, they are moving. They are dynamic. It's a dynamic hemoglobin. This consolidation is not retractile. It is likely a pneumonia, but not an atelectasis. Obstructive, of course. Each time you have a real-time diagnosis, for instance, uh, is it a giant bulla or a pneumothorax, you have the advantage of the real-time, that's no pneumothorax. If you want to assess the diaphragmatic function, ultrasound works better, of course, than a transversal motionless images. That makes no problem. If you want to have a better resolution, this is fluid on CAT scan. And if you make ultrasound, this fluid is alive. So definitely, if you add the slight inferiority of ultrasound plus the slight superiority, if you mix well, you have equality. And we can propose simple ultrasound as a reasonable bedside gold standard. And this is what we have to do with the babies. So if we can reduce the CAT scan, uh, of course, the radiography, we can reduce also. This young lady has a pneumothorax and is pregnant. So you can see she has the A prime profile, of course. And this is the target of the Lucy FLR project that is in the three next decades, we are cautious, to reduce one third of X-ray, but two thirds of chest urgent CAT scan. Because when you see that lung sliding has reappeared after a vacuum, you know that the lung is at the wall. And ultrasound will work better than the radiograph for this application. Lucy FLR project is lung ultrasound in the critically ill, favoring limitation of radiograph, not eradication, as some uh, transalpine doctors uh, are very enthusiastic to tell. But I think the idea uh, of eradicating the radiograph could be very, very scary as the resulting uh, acronym. So radiograph must be done uh, in the ICU and in a critical ill patient. Lucy FL, ah, limitation. No acronym for the neonates. Uh, I uh, lost a thousand of lives by not using an acronym for finding blood in the abdomen with the FAST protocol. But for the neonate, the doctors will not need an acronym for saving babies' lives. This is maybe the no acronym protocol. Let's be serious. In the neonate, we have the possibility to use lung ultrasound. And what I saw in my experience at Necker uh, neonate ICU is that the same signs, not one more, not one less, are available in the neonate. The neonate lung is a small adult lung, and now you know the same as me in one sentence. That's the FAT protocol. It works. At the anterior chest wall, you will have the usual profiles of the blue protocol. I must admit, of course, that the blue points that are posterior are more difficult. But anteriorly, you will be surprised to see lung sliding or no, lung brackets or no, fat protocol. Same signs with the neonates, and maybe one of them will become a lookout to your children. You do that in the critical care, in less critical care, uh, stations like the emergency room, ambulatory care, no adaptation is needed. Each time you raise the question of a pneumothorax, for instance. So we will spare a little time for the discussion. So blue protocol is a small part of lung ultrasound. Lung ultrasound is a small part of critical ultrasound. And critical ultrasound allows here an intensivist to make more uh, visual medicine, but the other specialties will also profit of the same signs. And I would say all the specialties that will highlight in blue will, each time you say lung in your profession, you will have interest to be specific and uh, non-invasive, repetitable, etc. method. 
this is the time where I had still black hair, but still already the on-site point of care uh, ultrasound. So I think it was the last slide. I think we have uh, some minutes before I have to go to the other room.